Okay, as the music fades, that means it's time for us to start the Guild Wars 2 PAX panel. Welcome, everybody! It is great to see such a full room for our presentation. We're really excited to have you all here. Give yourselves a big round of applause for crossing the street. Okay, my name is David Campbell. I'm a web and marketing guy. I'm your musical host for today. I'll break into song a little bit later on. Um, not wearing any deodorant today, so be thankful you're down there in the crowd and not up here with these guys. Um, sorry. Um, so, before we get things going and have our proper panel, we still got some people filing in uh, in the back, so we'll give them time to sit down. Um, but what I thought we could do is take a look at our brand new uh, trailer for Guild Wars 2, which looks pretty awesome on the, the big screens. So, let's just uh, wait one more second and then, yeah, we start it up. Here we go.
All right. So that's our latest trailer. One of our philosophies about making these trailers is not to farm them out to some other studio. We want uh, our trailers to look like the game. And so that's all gathered with in-game footage, cleverly edited and filmed by our cinematics team. We were awesome. But that's what the game looks like. So without any further ado, we're going to um, get this panel started. We're going to talk about uh, how PVE and Guild Wars 2 is a uh, cooperative and social experience and some other surprises. Uh, hang out until the end because we do have uh, some prizes um, that rhymes with car and p-shirt. Um, so um, you, you figure that out. But for now, let's introduce our panel. First off, we have, uh, let's see, we did an internal poll at ArenaNet, the most handsome game developer. And thank you. But coming in second, Colin Johansson. That's lead content designer Colin Johansson. Next up, we have our PvP lunchtime bully. We uh, gather, do PvP sessions, and this man always beats us all up. He uses his mad skills to make mad skills for you, game designer John Peters. All right. Next up, a man who casts a long shadow in the role-playing game community. You might have read many of his D&D books back in the day, but now he's ours. The lore master, Jeff Grubb. <laughs> Next up on our panel, uh, we have character artist who ha has an eye for detail and uh, uncompromising attention to quality. Yes, she just redesigned the Sil Silvari, and now she'll redesign your mind. Kristen Perry. <laughs> All right, and finally, the unseen, unstoppable force that moves Guild Wars 2 forward, forward until the date that we release it. We call him the Quiet Storm, Eric Flanham. <laughs> I'm trying to get that nickname to stick. I'll, I'll turn it over to these guys. Have at it. All right. Thanks, Dave. Um, so we were here today to talk about cooperative gameplay in MMOs. Uh, and when we sat down to start working on developing Guild Wars 2, one of the first questions we asked about traditional MMOs is, we have millions of players coming into these game worlds together. Are we actually developing game mechanics that encourage these players to play together and build a community and play cooperatively? Uh, and the answer that we found is resoundingly in most areas, no, we aren't. Uh, if you take traditional quests in a traditional MMO, we've all had that experience where you get a quest and you go running off to an area and you start killing stuff, and another player runs up and they start killing things in the same area, and they're actually hampering your ability to complete the quest. They're stealing loot from you, and they're basically ruining your experience in this online game. And the thing is, we're building these games to bring all these players together into an online game space. Why are we actually making them be at conflict with one another? We should be building content types, and we should be building a game that actually encourages them to play together, work together, and be rewarded for it. So when we started out on Guild Wars 2, one of the first things we decided to do with our core content types in the game is that we were not going to have traditional quests in this game. Uh, we felt that we were capable of doing something more than that that could build a sense of community and build a sense of cooperation and a bond between our players. So we decided to build our dynamic event system as our core content type for Guild Wars 2. And the way these dynamic events work uh, is they are events that occur in the world, and they can be often part of large event chains. Uh, and the events actually occur for everyone. This content occurs for everyone, and it happens in a specific location. Uh, so for example, you may have a fort uh, out in the middle of the brand. And this is an area that a dragon has breathed on and turned it into a branded area. And the Char build a fort on top of this to try to be able to defend this land and try to take it back from the dragon minions that have taken it over. And the first event in this dynamic event chain, this fort will be attacked by dragon minions. And players get the opportunity to defend it. And this event is available for everyone who is in the world and everyone who is in the map at that time. And this event actually dynamically scales. So the more players who show up to participate in the event, the more enemies the event sends at it so that there's actually enough content for everyone to do, regardless of the number of players that are participating. Now, while you're participating in this event, you're actually earning participation towards the event. Every creature you help kill, uh, even if you're not the one who deals the killing blow, you can actually work with other players, and everyone who's helping do things in the event is earning participation credit towards the event. And when the event ends, everyone who participated in the event is actually rewarded for it. 
Uh, this creates a sense of cooperation for the players and encourages them to play together instead of playing apart from one another. This content actually brings players together in our game world as opposed to pushing them apart from one another. And so what ends up happening as we've seen on the show floor, as we've seen on our own in-house usability testing, uh, is as players start playing the game, they start running into each other in areas where events happen. And they start playing together, and they start building a sense of community and cooperation with one another. And then they start following each other and running around in the map together. And they may never join a group together, they may never join a guild together, but they end up playing together, and they end up actually being rewarded for doing so. Events get more exciting the more players that are there. Uh, there's more content for everyone to do, and it doesn't actually harm your experience. You actually want to be around other players in our open world, as opposed to not having them around. Now, we've also carried this core concept over to our second type of content, which is our personal story. And the personal story is your character's story in our world. Uh, this is the, on, on par with what you would find in a fantastic single-player RPG. This is putting that RPG back into an MMORPG. And the idea is when you create your character, you fill out a biography, and that biography has you answering questions about who your character is in the world. Uh, did you come from the city streets? Were you a commoner? Were you a noble? Uh, were you a member of the Ash Legion, the Iron Legion, or the Blood Legion? And based on the choice that you make, that actually determines the storyline that your character is going to get to experience in the game. But rather than limit that storyline to just you, you can bring your friends along with you to participate and help you with your personal story. And you can go along with them and help them on their personal story. And the game actually dynamically scales the content in your personal story as well. So the more friends you bring with you, the more enemies there are, the harder the bosses are. Everything scales in difficulty, so it's an exactly balanced battle based on the number of people you bring with you. So you can always play with the people you want to play with. Uh, another thing that we've done to help with this uh, is we have a sidekicking system in Guild Wars 2 that basically allows you to, if, you know, if John is level 70 and I'm level 2, uh, John doesn't have to make a new character to come play with me. He can take his existing character, he can go to where I am in the world, and the game will actually sidekick him down to level two and let him play with me so he can play the character he wants to play as opposed to being restricted and having to go back and make a new character. I think we've all had those moments playing, in a, playing an MMO where there's somebody who's making a new character or there's a friend that you really want to play with and you can't do it or you have to sacrifice what you really want to be doing to do that. Uh, and we have gotten rid of that in Guild Wars 2 with our sidekicking system. So you can always play with the people you want to play with you're always rewarded for playing with other players, and the game makes it uh, a system that actually encourages you to do so as opposed to make it a problem for wanting to play with other players. So the last thing uh, on a kind of high level from the content side that we've done uh, is we've actually set up the base rules for killing creatures to help build a sense of community as well. Uh, if I attack a creature and another player comes up and attacks that creature and helps me kill it, we both get experience for that creature, and we both get rolls on the loot table. So there is no kill stealing, there's no mob tagging, other players in the area are actually helping you kill things faster, getting you rewarded faster, so you're rewarded for having other players around as opposed to having uh, the game discourage you from wanting them around. So that covers some of the high-level stuff. I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to tell you more about uh, cooperative gameplay, uh, in particular in the uh, realms of PvP and combat for Guild Wars 2. Yeah, so Colin talked a little bit about the PvE experience, and I'll kind of get to combat later, but since we're showing it here, I want to talk a little bit about how this relates to PvP, too. Um, when you're fighting against other players, you know, you don't just want to kill faceless people. You want to kill people that you know. You know, there's some sense of uh, <laughs> satisfaction in beating players that you have kind of learned their, their skill sets and learned stuff about. So. A lot of these other games, they have what we call uh, PvP lobbies, where you just kind of join in, you get put in the game, that game ends, you leave, those people you fought against, you'll probably never see them again. Uh, so one thing we wanted to do is create what is a server browser of PvP. It's kind of a list of games, and you kind of start to join the same games and build a community on these servers that you're joining, you know, fight with and against the same people, which is really important to build uh, PvP communities as well. Um, so. After that, talking a little about the combat stuff, everything about the combat is also built to be really social too. Uh, every profession of the game can res everyone else. So when players go down, you know, everyone has a chance to come back and bring their allies back into the fight. Uh, we've built a lot of pieces just to make players be able to work together. And uh, one of the most important of these is the cross-profession combos. Uh, what, these let, what this let players do is one player uses one skill and another player will use a second skill and they kind of combine together to create a new effect that you can only do when you do these two things in conjunction. So 
we've talked about a few of these, but you know, this stuff is coming along now. And uh, kind of one of the big things we try and do is create uh, categories of combos that work together. So at first, you know, we just talked about shooting arrows through a firewall. Well, it's a lot about creating areas in the world and then having uh, characters interact through them. So as an example now, like if you're a guardian, you can lay down a symbol on the ground and players can either shoot through it, they can leap through it, they can whirl inside of it, and each of these things kind of has different things that it brings to the table. So, you know, as you're fighting combat now, you're starting to look around the world and look for other players to do these things and actually work together with, which kind of brings me to what is the most important piece of uh, combat and bringing people together, which is uh, not the Holy Trinity. So, uh, players, Play, have played a lot of games, I'm sure you guys all have, with the Trinity combat, where you have your healers, you have your tanks, you have your DPS players. You know, this Trinity system, people say it's about working together. To me, it actually just creates a lot of dependencies between players, but they don't actually play together. They are totally dependent on each other, they cannot play without each other, but it doesn't mean that they're actually playing together. They're not actually, you know, doing things and communicating with each other other than telling them like, all right, I, I'm low on health, heal me now. But it's not like uh, you're actually working together. And for us, the cross-profession combos and the lack of these distinct roles is really what makes people actually play together rather than uh, separate from each other. Um, you know, as we play a lot in the office, you see things where we're fighting a big boss, we're fighting a hard creature, and you know, no one, everyone's health is a little low. The warrior can then step up and you know, block that attack for a few seconds while other people have a chance to heal up. But once he's done blocking, he needs to move out of the way. He needs to let someone else take over that role. It makes the combat a lot more dynamic and a lot more social because you have to be communicating with your uh, friends and playing with them, so not just next to them. Uh, so speaking of the Trinity, uh, kind of the biggest thing that this helps us solve too is just the dependency on looking for other players to play together. And uh, Jeff's going to talk a little bit about that. Sure. One of our... Uh... One of our uh, more traditional uh, forms of uh, uh, play in, in MMO, of course, is the instance dungeon. This is an uh, instance area for a number of players who basically are going a set number of people. But because of the Trinity, we tend to, you tend to have to uh, find a particular group. You need a healer. You need people who fit particular roles to go in. And what you end up with is people who are not going or they're not going with friends or they're, just, they're looking for the healer in order to take on the dungeon. We want, with the death of the uh, Holy Trilogy, Tri uh, Trinity in uh, uh, Guild Wars 2, instead what we're seeing is people are playing with friends. People are playing, you have your adventuring group, you're going into the dungeon, you get five people, and you basically are ready to go. Or you can, do, you can also do the pickup group. You don't need to have a specific build. You don't need to have a specific class in order to defeat the dungeon. And that's very important because it makes it more open and accessible for a lot of people who won't go into this type of play because it involves you know, talking to people you don't know or your group doesn't have, a, have a, the particular setup or you're not a sufficient level etc and it just this opens the door for people to play in a uh, wider uh, uh, gap now it also helps us the designers because when you're designing this type of dungeon if you're going with a Trinity mo a tr a tr Holy Trinity model you have to say well we have to assume that everybody will have the healer that this will be the particular structure and so we're re we reinforce that very uh, setup that causes people to uh, not play in the first place. So in this case, with our, with our dungeons, you can go in with your five players. You can go basically, that is our limit, and we can design to five people and not to necessary particular professions. Now, in our instances, in our dungeons, we uh, also like to have, some, have the variety. We have divided our, each of our eight dungeons that will be available in the uh, opening of uh, Guild Wars 2 will uh, have a story mode and an explorable mode. And the story mode will be of uh, a large meta story that belongs to all of the dungeons and parts of all, and as you move through the dungeons, you experience the full story. Each dungeon stands on itself. This is we designed to be survivable by a good organized pickup group. The explorable mode is 
a version that has takes place in the same place from a uh, plot standpoint takes place after the story mode. So things you do in story mode have an effect on explorable mode. But there are other options within explorable modes, so it's not the same dungeon every time you walk into it. You basically make other choices, other things happen. So it creates a wider variety so you don't see that continual repetition of play that you see often in traditionals. Okay, we have to hit X, we have to hit Y, why we have to hit Z. It allows some more, again, variety and more depth. So when we say we have eight dungeons, we really have 32 dungeons. And these explorable dungeons are meant to be tough. They are meant to be dungeons that will test the abilities and skills of a mixed group of players. Now, we get to the end of the dungeons, and uh, this is, a, again, a problem that we've seen in MMOs. You go all the way through the dungeons, you defeat the final, final monster, it gives a drop that you can't use. You've been there. <laughs> Some, they, they got the witch bow, the bow that, shows, that shoots witches, you know, and no, no, that's not, I can't use that. What we've done instead is we've allowed you to have uh, tokens that will, and it unlocks uh, reward armor types. So you can get the armor that you want. You can get the weapon that you want. You can basically create and customize your character and your reward experience as well. And everybody gets it. Nobody gets the cool item. You all get the cool item. And again, this is something that encourages you as a group to go together and experience the dungeons one after another, both in story mode and repeatable mode. And as we move forward, you have your ability to uh, customize your character, your look, your feel. So basically, you, when you, other people see you, they're not seeing the elementalist in the elementalist armor that defeated the uh, 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 Ghost of Ascalon uh, uh, dungeon, because I know because you're wearing that armor, but rather someone who is basically choosing the armor that works best for them. And with the idea of customization, I'm going to pass on to Kristen. So uh, a big thing about social interaction in this game visually is, of course, character customization. Um, we're wanting to make sure that you guys have a lot more choices for your characters this time around in, in GW2. So we've opened up, instead of just by profession, which it used to be in Guild Wars 1, uh, now it is by weight class. So if you're going to be more of a caster, you'll be able to, to wear that class of armor, uh, light armor. If you're going to be more of a ranger type medium and more of a warrior and so forth, it would be heavy, in which case within those classes, you're not regulated to one specific look that might be to that profession. You can actually mix and match through anything that you want. And uh, a lot of these things have uh, some nice side effects I'm actually looking forward to in the game is that uh, fashion-wise, since we're all fashionable people here, I, I actually really hope that there'll be fads that sort of naturally occur, like maybe, uh, you know, the spikes are in in the spring, uh, maybe, you know, <laughs> chains are in the summer. It will be Fabulous. It would be awesome. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what the community is going to do uh, in order to show off some of the really cool stuff that they get through exploring through the world, through rewards in the, in the armor and, and, uh, and through the dungeons and so forth. And, uh, and for this, for character customization, we're also making sure that uh, personally, as, as, you know, aside from just what you're wearing, the character that you create upon uh, initially creating the uh, that's the character at the beginning, is going to have a whole lot of options. If you're human um, and a lot of the races, we have uh, different kinds of sliders for the faces. Well, we'll be able to choose from a bunch of different kinds of, of uh, uh, designs of faces, but within that, you'll be able to customize like how wide the nose is, how long of it is it turned up, you know, uh, and how you know, if your eyes are a little larger. For the uh, char, for example, uh, one of the really cool things is that you'll be able to uh, dye your fur one color and then choose maybe uh, a fur pattern like um, a leopard or a tiger or you know it's just it, it's really awesome you'll be able to choose how what color that is going to be you'll be able to choose different kinds of horn designs different kinds of facial designs uh, all of this kind of stuff um, for the Savari as well uh, we'll be able to to have different kinds of uh, different hairs uh, they have a, a very large selection of ears designs as well, so uh, you're going to be able to get a lot of visual identity through your, uh, through your character customization, but we're going to make sure that the, that doesn't go without, there's going to be limits to where those sliders can go. As you can see uh, in, in, uh, in some forms, is that if you 
stretch the nose too big, it becomes inhuman, it becomes, you know, grotesque. It might actually, uh, it might actually hurt the immersion of other players in the game. So we want to make sure that there's a visual continuity, there's a sense of community, there's going to be, you know, a sense of everybody is, is, is within this world and a part of this world. So we're going to make sure that, it, you know, visually that that is maintained. Um, uh, one of the other things that, uh, that I've been working on actually, that, uh, is the dice system. I don't know if you guys know about this dice system yet. No? <laughs> Woo! All right. <laughs> um, I, I had a, a while, a few conventions ago, I had promised that I was going to uh, put in 400 different dye colors. I had finished that last week. They're all individually named. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and the really cool thing about this dye system is, uh, it, you know, in, uh, especially with the GW2, is that we're able to have more than one piece of your armor. So, for example, that coat, uh, if it has a lot of different detail, you might be able to dye the lapel one color. You, you could actually dye the base of the coat some other color. Uh, perhaps it has some metal fixtures on it. Whatever, whatever is visually appropriate to break up into um, up to three uh, dye channels. Uh, per, per piece, but not every piece would actually require it. For example, if you just have a little leather glove or some plain pants, and there's no visual reason to, you know, chop it up unnecessarily and unnaturally. So it'll be, it'll be appropriate to whatever that design of that piece of armor is. Um, and in which case, uh, a lot of the uh, organization for the die system is uh, in place for, you'll be able to to organize, like perhaps by hue, perhaps by temperature, you know, whether you have, uh, you know, warms, cools, and naturals, and so forth. But also, there's a favorites tab, so you can pick your favorites or the most well used uh, colors that you like to go back to. And that's really interesting because. Uh, you'll be able to, to save off palettes that maybe you want to use between your characters, maybe you want to use between other characters that you're hanging out with, maybe you have uh, team colors and guild colors. And so you'll be able to start organizing all of this together, you'll be able to start choosing exactly how you guys want to look individually and collectively, and from that, as I've uh, touched on guilds, I'll turn it over to Eric. So we've been talking a lot about the uh, social nature of the game, and of course, um, when you think social and you think uh, MMOs, you think about guilds. <clears throat> and we've been pretty quiet about what our plans for guilds are, uh, and so uh, we wanted to kind of start talking about the way that guilds function in Guild Wars 2 a little bit more. Uh, so the first thing that we looked at when we were looking at guilds is we tried to break down um, from a very basic level, what, what do people really want from guilds? We, we tried to sort of throw out some of the preconceptions that we had about how guilds usually function in an MMO and look at like, hey, these are the things that would be really cool. And guilds are basically um, social networks. And so the very first thing that we decided is, well, it's really cool to be able to belong to different social networks. And it, it kind of sucks that um, I have a character and in most games I'm bound to a single guild and it's, you know, it's a pretty big commitment to go from guild to guild. And so um, even if I have different groups of friends or different guilds that I hang out with, I can't belong to both of them at the same time. So what we've done in Guild Wars 2 is the way guild um, membership works is your account belongs to a guild and you can belong to as many guilds as you want. And at any time on a given character, you can choose to represent any of the guilds that are linked to your account. So if I'm not in a very sociable mood that day, I can choose to represent no guilds. Um, if I'm gonna PVP that day, I can represent, go to any character and say, okay, PVPing today, I'm gonna represent my PVP guild. And representing that guild means you're gonna have the tag flying after your name, you're gonna see guild chat, you're gonna see all of those things, people are gonna see that you're online. Um, and if you're not representing the guild, then they won't see those things. So um, it's kind of up to you. You get to join whichever guilds you want, whichever groups of friends that you want, and uh, you choose to represent the guild that you feel like representing at any given time. Um, and so it was very, very important to us to give people a lot of flexibility with how they join guilds. Um, so that's the very, the very first part of, of how guilds are different in Guild Wars 2. Um, the second thing is, uh, we wanted to give people reasons to be in guilds and reasons to play together. And so um, what you do is if you're um, doing almost anything in the game together with your guild mates, you'll earn something called uh, influence. And as you earn influence as a guild, you have kind of this um, uh, tech tree that you might see in like, you know, a strategy game or something like that. And you're spending the influence. 
um, on unlocking things for your guild. So there are all kinds of perks that you can unlock, you know, things like guild storage, things like guild calendars, um, so you can organize all your events. Um, and more importantly, things that facilitate you playing together with your guild. So you can do things like research, um, and use influence to purchase a flag that you can then put down in an area and um, everybody in your guild who's playing in that area together will get an XP bonus. Um, things like that. So, so what we wanted to try to do was really give the guild kind of this shared goal of building up influence and then giving them a way to spend it on things that are, that are cool. Um, so another thing that we've, we've mentioned before is we have our world versus world type of PvP. Um, Guilds will be able to claim keeps in World vs. World. They'll be able to um, upgrade keeps. They'll be able to use their influence to make the keep harder to uh, take. And then everybody who's playing World vs. World can see, hey, this guild is flying their flag from this, this keep. Um, and you can kind of have an, an identity in the world as a guild together. Um, so that's a little bit about um, sort of what you can expect from guilds. Um, obviously, that's not everything. There's a, a lot more things to talk about, and we'll, we'll continue to talk about those things as we, as we sort of finalize details on them. Um, so I think that's basically it for our presentation today. Um, we wanted to do a, a Q&A. So um, if people wanted to uh, ask some questions about stuff that we have talked about now or, or just about anything, you can Absolutely. feel free to ask. We have strategically placed two microphones in each yeah. of the two uh, aisles. So I, I will start. Um, it's it'll be it'll release when it's ready. Uh, you beat and, me to uh, it. Yes. Yeah. When's the release date? You yeah. can jump. That's another common and, uh, one. Yes. The, the commando is clearly the eighth profession. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, we're forming an orderly queue. I appreciate no elbows being thrown, no stomp attacks. That's nice. <laughs> What's that? Sir, why don't you start things off for us? Hi, first of all, I'd like to say that the game looks amazing so far, and I'm very excited about it. Um, I had a question about multiple players attacking the same mob. Um, you said that they both get XP, and they both get rolls on the loot table, but I was wondering if it was commensurate with the damage that they, were, that they each dealt, or how that's gonna be split up. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So it's, it's a minimum threshold of damage that each character needs to meet to qualify. So for example, if you know, a, a level one guy goes running past and swings their sword and dinks for one damage and runs off, they're not going to qualify for anything. Uh, as long as you meet that minimum threshold, everyone who helped kill that creature will qualify for it. Uh, but there are not different levels of rewards based on the amount of damage you did. Uh, there's only two levels. There's either you didn't qualify or you did. And as long as you do a reasonable amount of damage, you qualify for the rewards from that creature, you'll get full experience and you'll get a roll on a loot table for it. Thank you now, very much. In our, event system, in our event system, of course, we have different levels of uh, contribution and different rewards at that point. That's not quite the same thing as fighting an additional uh, one mob, but participating in an event, if you walk in at the very end and you contribute, you'll get less of a uh, reward than if you've been there the entire time. Yeah, so. so real quick, before we do the next question, since this is the sort of the Q&A session, people start to trickle out, and I do want to remind folks that we do have some prizes. So I thought we would do that now, um, as opposed to the end. So you guys that are lined for your, your questions and stuff, you know where you're sitting and everything like that? We had deducted a really scientific way of distributing these prizes evenly. We have 10 of them. Um, so we came up with this really scientific method, then we said, uh, the hell with it. So, we put stuff under your chairs. If you could look under your chairs right now. <laughs> now everybody's going to check. <laughs> They're taped under there. Oh, I've thrown the room into chaos. This is awesome. Here's the story. If you did find something under, under your seat, taped under your seat, it's 4HR plushie. And your own custom Guild Wars 2 Arena Net Commando Jersey. Yeah. Now, here's what we'll need you to do. We want to actually put your name on the back of these Commando Jerseys, am I right, Regina? And get your contact information. So, anybody who won, at the end, come and meet Regina or myself over here at the side of the stage and we'll make sure you're taken care of. Now we resume our regularly scheduled Q&A session. <laughs> Gentlemen? Thank you. Uh, I had a question about the PVE system, the um, group system. Uh, you're saying that uh, to, to eliminate the Holy Trinity is going to encourage more people to play together, but um, pessimistically speaking, uh, people are lazy. Gamers especially, they're using their free time to relax and play a game. So uh, usually you'll find the path of least resistance to accomplish what you're trying to do. So without having to have a tank, having to have a healer, what, what are you doing to incentivize people to smartly make a party and not like min-max, 
Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, I mean, it's a good question, but to me, the real answer is most of the time, uh, people really actually just want to play with their friends. Um, so that's what that system is about. Uh, there aren't really builds that are so much better, so much worse. Sure, there's things you're going to do and you're going to want to coordinate after you make a team, but you don't have to coordinate before you make a team. If Colin and hey, let's say the five of us are all playing together and all of us have warriors, you know, we can still play together and after we make our team and start going to fight stuff, we might want to think about, you know, someone should probably bring some support skills, someone should probably have a shield, you know, you might want to have a guy with a rifle, but it's not about we don't we can't take Eric even though he's our friend just because he's got a warrior too and there's already four of us you know that's not what the system's about and that's basically how it plays yeah. I can elaborate on that a little bit too right, so um, one of the things about it is that uh, uh, the Holy Trinity systems are very much about um, taking a specific um, strategy and the same strategy over and over again and imposing that upon the encounter um, that strategy is almost always pull, tank, damage, heal, right? Um, and what we wanted with Guild Wars 2 Combat is to um, live more in that space where something went wrong and now you have to pay attention to what's going on and you have to use the tools at your disposal to react to the situation. And so um, what ends up happening is um, in Guild Wars 2, I would much rather have a good player than a player who plays a specific profession. And the reason for that is because that player is going to be able to react very um, in the right way with the right tools at their disposal to any situations that we get into. And, and so it's very much about learning what your profession can do in various situations and about us as designers building that versatility in. You know, Trinity systems get built very specifically for that. The guys who can heal generally can't do a heck of a lot else. The guys who tank generally don't do a lot else. And so what we've done is we've said, well, let's make all of our guys do different things, but let's let them do it in kind of a different style. And, and then the game becomes much more about applying the tools that we give you in your toolbox to the situation at hand. Um, and so there, there really isn't as much of a sort of min-maxi thing because player skill is really going to make up for build. Um, I hope that helps answer it. Okay, thank you. So within the dy uh, dynamically scaling events, um, what kind of systems are in place to keep people from just like hanging out in an area and making the event that much harder, but not really actually contributing to the event? Like what, what are the factors that contribute to the event actually getting harder when people are around? Uh, so the, the game actually uh, is constantly polling for the actions each one of the characters is doing inside of the event. Uh, and they have to be actively participating to actually count both towards scaling the event and towards uh, getting rewards for the event. Um, so somebody could actually run in and they could start playing the event and then they could run off and go make a cup of coffee and the game's going to pick up that they ran off and it's going to stop scale counting them towards scaling and the event will actually scale back down and not include them anymore because they are not actively participating in the event. And the event is constantly looking at that to see what's going on to make the exact right challenge for the number of people that are, that are there that are participating in the event. Um, one other common question we get about griefing that comes with events is what happens if a really high level character runs in and starts killing everything? Uh, and I talked a little bit earlier about our sidekicking system and about how that's a, a tool that you can use to always play with your friends wherever they are in the world. Um, it also doubles as an anti-griefing mechanism. Uh, so if a level 80 character runs in and starts trying to ruin your level 3 event, the game actually auto sidekicks them down to level 3 uh, so they can't ruin the event. <laughs> Thank All you. right, uh, the gentleman in the nice white t-shirt, I like that shirt. Uh, thank you. Um, so you were saying you can be in multiple guilds and with this guild system, mm -hmm. and I was wondering how will you be able to be in multiple guild chats at the same time, because you said you can switch in between? Yeah, so you can't be in multiple guild chats at the same time currently. Um, you have to, um, it's pretty simple to change, like it's just as simple as, as pulling up your uh, a guild chat tab and then saying represent this guild instead. So um, you'd have to switch between them, but it's pretty easy to do. Um, but yeah, you can't see multiple guild chats at the same time. And Currently, is there any kind of um, planned voiceover protocol in game for like guilds? Uh, we're still talking about that, um, what, what we want to do for um, whether or not we're going to go with any sort of built-in um, you know, VOIP or whether we want to try to um, work with a third party 
um, person or, or something like that. So uh, that's something that's still under consideration. So, yeah. Real quick, before we do the next question, found a phone, orange iPhone. Anybody missing one? It's passcoded, so I can't get in here. Worth another prize. Hmm. All right. I'll be working on this, uh, hacking on it. So if anybody is missing it, <laughs> just uh, let me know. All right. All right. So my question isn't so much about anything current, more so about the future of Guild Wars 2. Um, playing Guild Wars, the original when it first came out, the content wasn't regularly updated. It wasn't, there wasn't anything new consistently. You know, we got, I think almost every six months we'd get something new on average. But um, I was wondering if you're going to do it more often with this game, if it's going to be consistent updates with the game instead of, oh, big expansion this year, big expansion next year, you know. Sure. So um, one of the big things about Guild Wars 2 is our team has grown uh, immensely um, from the, the team that we had for Guild Wars 1. Um, in Guild Wars 1, it took almost all of our effort to, uh, you know, for example, after we released Prophecies, it took almost our entire team to make factions, and it took almost our entire team to make um, Nightfall after that. And so um, what we're planning to do is um, switch to a team that can release um, regular content, um, and then another team that, we'll have two teams, we'll have a team that can also um, uh, create expansions. And so one of the things about um, the future, you know, we've, we've had lots of uh, controversial things about, about what exactly we're going to release where. Um, I can say right now, we'll, we'll release free content, we'll release some content through our store probably, and we'll release some stuff. Um, we'll definitely have box expansions. What goes into those things, we have no idea right now, to be perfectly honest. A lot of it is going to depend on um, what makes sense for us to do from a financial standpoint and also what our fans seem like they want. Um, and so we'll, we'll be listening to feedback and we'll be looking for feedback on what sorts of things people want to see. You know, obviously everybody wants stuff for free, but, um, but you know, we'll have to, we'll have to make um, our uh, judgments on, you know, what's the best model for us going forward with the game. All right, thank you. Okay. Next up, the chart chooses you. <laughs> so let's say that a friend and I each create new level one characters. And because I'm feeling generous, I decide that we can play through his personal story first. Um, do we then have to start over and play through my personal story? Does it downscale us to level one? Or is it, I mean, how does that scale? Um, so you can, you can go play uh, at any time. You can go join in with your friend's personal story. They can come help you with yours. Uh, and you can progress along together. Uh, if you guys have the exact same personal story and you go and do a step together, um, you can actually choose to take the progress that your friend made on that step and have it as your own if you want to, or if they made a decision that you don't like, if you're like, oh, I don't want my best friend to die, no way, I'm not going to take that choice. Um, you can choose to say, I don't want to take that progress, and then replay it in your own personal story and make different decisions than them. So you always have the option there. You can play with your friends if you want to, you can take the progress they make, or you can make your own progress as well. Um, and those do scale, so the players that are there have it balanced for them. Um, with a person who gets reduced in their level, what kind of rewards are they going to experience by helping out someone lower level than they are? Do you want to get it? you want to get it? Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, when somebody is reduced in level, they'll receive rewards that are um, good for their level, not, um, not exactly, you know, optimal. But they also don't get nothing. So, um, so it's, it's kind of a balance. You, you are giving some... Like, if you're a player who... who um, is operating at like peak efficiency and like is gaining, you know, the maximum amount of loot and XP per minute that you could possibly gain for your level. Um, if you go inside kick down, you're probably going to see that decrease, but it's not going to be that big a deal um, given kind of the way that we do our XP curves and things like that. That's one of the big things is we don't really treat um, leveling as the end all be all of the game. And so um, it's not as important um, that you see a little bit of an efficiency decrease, but it is still definitely worth your while to play the game sidekicked. Um, you still do get cool drops. You still do get, um, uh, XP and all that, so. Thank you very much. Yep. Next up. This is kind of a two-part question, but um, it's about the uh, dynamic events. And the first thing is, is that, um, is it going to be, the participation point's gonna be intelligent? Because I notice a lot of times in, in different um, dynamic events that it's, everybody's just kill, 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 kill. The guy who's sitting over there buffing everybody is like, wait a minute, I didn't get crap for loot. <laughs> you know, or the person who decides, oh, I better heal because everybody's dying and, you know, they don't end up getting Either. So is it going to be intelligent? Yeah, there, there are a lot of different, each, each event will have different conditions that it's pulling for to give participation based on the things that you can do in the event. 
Um, there are a few things on the show floor we don't have hooked up yet right now. Like if you're buffing everybody, the game actually doesn't recognize that yet. Um, that's something, the kind of things that we'll be looking at, at doing as we get closer to release. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do in events though right now that earn you uh, participation. If you resurrect another player or an NPC when you're in an event, uh, and you help bring them back to life and get them back in the fight, you actually get full credit for that towards participating in the event. Um, if there's a town that's on fire and you help put out the fires, each one of those that you put out you're earning participation for. Uh, if you have an event where you're raiding an enemy fort, uh, oftentimes we'll add extra stuff in this area that not only can you do to blow up uh, enemies, but you can blow up all the stuff that they own there. So you can raid through and you can take out their homes, you can blow up uh, supply crates. All of that stuff is bonus extra stuff that's available there, and all of that gives you participation as well towards those events. Okay, so and then the second part of that is, is so each of these is going to be like a level range, right? So, I mean, if I'm a level 20 going into a 15 event, then maybe that would work, but if I was like, you were saying, I'm griefing because I'm level 80, then I'm going to be sidekicked mm -hmm. down. So. I mean, is it the kind of thing where I walk in, it's like, do you want a sidekick down, or is it going to tell me, or I'm... Yeah, so you would be, anytime you get sidekicked in the game, the game is going to notify you that's happening. We're not going to, like, do that on the sly, and you're like, what's yeah. wrong? Uh, oh, I suck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you'll, you'll definitely be notified. Uh, there's a certain range that we're still working on right now, finalizing exactly what the reasonable range is of like you're, you know, there's a reasonable level around an event where you can fight it and you're not going to be ruining the experience for everybody else. And we want to have as much content available to you as possible. So we want you to be able to play stuff if you're a couple levels over it and still enjoy it. And then if you get really high level over it, be able to get sidekicked and come back and play that content if you want as well. You know, one of, one of the great things about having this dynamic, open, living world where the maps are constantly changing is with the sidekicking system, you can actually go back to maps that you never saw or go back to maps that you already played through and you might get to experience completely unique content, you know, five, ten hours later than what was going on when you went through it. And we want people to be able to do that. We want them to be able to experience that and play with their friends wherever they are. Thank you. Yeah. Next up. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is, the, uh, you mentioned that when we get items, we're getting sort of um, items that will fit us or help us. Um, can you elaborate on how the items will work? Are they going to work similar to Guild Wars in terms of like customization just for your character or are there going to be like item slots as you see in other games or is it going to be more the traditional one? Um, I guess I can take it. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so our item system is um, characters have uh, armor slots, they have uh, weapon slots, they have um, utility slots, they have a back slot for uh, an item that can go on their back, um, helmet, all those kind of standard things. Um, every item has an upgrade slot, so everything from rings to earrings to weapons um, all have one upgrade slot. So like in Guild Wars, um, people were familiar with um, runes and um, uh, weapon grips and things like that. That's kind of the, the replacement for those things. Um, like for example, we do all of our set rewards um, by having crests, which you collect sets of, and then the more crests of a particular type you have, the more of a bonus you get. Um, it is generally true that um, the range of effectiveness of items in Guild Wars 2 is a lot broader than Guild Wars 1. Items, I think it's safe to say, make more of a difference than they did in Guild Wars 1. Um, the one thing that hasn't changed is kind of our philosophy of um, the kind of, um, standard plateau of power that you get to at any given point in the game shouldn't be super grindy and hard to get to. It should be relatively easy and that appearance is more the thing that you kind of have to work and go that extra mile for. So would it be possible to create an item that looks, well, sort of like you can do now in Guild Wars, create an item that looks exactly like another item but has the stats of that original drop that you have? Yes, so there's an item called a transmutation stone that you can get for karma, which you get as a reward for helping people in their personal story and also for doing events. And that can take the upgrade Id appearance and um, statistics of any items of a like type and mix and match them. So um, if you have an upgrade of any kind, like let's say you have the appearance and the upgrade that you really like and then you have the stats of a new item, you can mix them that way or you could take the upgrade and stats from one item and put the appearance of the other item on them. So you can kind of mix and match the items. All right, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Hey, uh, real, real quick before the next question, uh, for just a second here, uh, we want to give a little shout out to uh, Jean and Carol Johansson here in the front row. It's their 40th wedding anniversary today. Give it up for these guys. If there are any other anniversaries, uh, just shout out now. Yeah. No? Okay, good. All right, you're next. Okay, dope. So I had a question about uh, weapon skills and learning. So you've seen from the demos now that you, know, you guys have implemented a new skill learning system for when players are first starting out to get their new weapon skills. 
So I was wondering, um, after you get those first five skills, what's going to be the progression for those beyond that? Is that something that traits are going to delve into later on? Like, are you going to be able to get traits to replace some of those skills possibly? Or am I delving too far as it's not quite there yet? All right. Uh, I wouldn't say they would replace the skills, but they're definitely going to enhance them in different ways. Uh, the trait system, we just scrapped it, so <laughs> we're rebuilding it all. It still is going to do the same thing, but just the way it works is going to be a little different. Uh, so there is stuff uh, that's kind of going to be where your progression takes over. Both um, once you've kind of unlocked your weapon skills, you're going to have traits plus the, everything that's on the right hand of your skill bar. So unlocking of healing skills, unlocking of utility skills, unlocking of elite skills as well for build making. Oh, very cool. Next up. Hi, I was wondering if you are planning on having a end game cash shop that uses real world currency and if so, I'm hoping you'll tell me it'll just be cosmetic or fluff type items and not the pay to win items. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we've, we've talked a little bit about this and at some point we'll have more details but um, uh, we're going to have a, an in-game shop uh, similar to what we have in Guild Wars 1 where, um, you know, we tend to feature um, cosmetic things and, and, and things like that. Um, our, our basic philosophy is that we don't want um, item shop items that make it feel like the game is a pain in the butt to play unless you have them or that um, are things like, um, wow, I just can't play the game without these things. Um, so, you know, uh, We'll release more details on it, but, but right now it's basically the same sort of philosophy that we use in Guild Wars 1 where, where it tends to be, um, you know, uh, cosmetic sort of stuff. There's, there's actually some, some pretty cool things um, along those lines that we're, we're planning for it too, but uh, we'll release more details on that later. But yeah, fundamentally we don't want it to be a thing where you have to buy items in the cash shop in order to play the game. Okay, thank you. So my little char timekeeper says we have about five minutes left, so I think we have time for another question and another question over here. Go ahead. Um, I have a question about bosses and, love and naming. Um, if I kill a centaur boss, say like Larry, okay, if I kill Larry and I come back and the dynamic event chain has reset and um, it's time to kill that same centaur boss again, will he have the same name? Because that seems kind of ridiculous. Larry. Okay. Um, no, actually, one of the things we're doing, one of the things we're doing in design is we are trying to avoid naming the centaur boss Larry, just because <laughs> he would be centaur chieftain. If it's a replaceable, you'll see this in characters that uh, um, uh, that the die as a result of, of events as well. Basically, because we don't want to see them keep coming back in the same character. There may be a centaur boss. He, unless it's in a instance. Uh, a personal instance or a dungeon instance, he'll tend to be called a centaur boss. So, for example, um, guys like the Shatterer. Mm -hmm. The Shatterer is not actually his name. He's sort that's sort of his his uh, designation as a, a class of creature. And to quaddle and to quaddle the Sunless is a, a Hylic name for this, the you know the one the dark yeah. one in darkness. So what does to quaddle actually mean? It means the one in darkness. <laughs> there you go. Right, thank you. Okay, next up. Hey, so in the trailer we saw those um, airships or blimps in the sky. Um, can you go on about who made them, how they work, and how they'll affect the game? Um, how much can I say? Uh, <laughs> spoilers? Um, yeah, spoilers. Oh, yeah, okay. so uh, yeah, they, they play a major part in the, uh, the storyline, but yes. I, don't, I don't think we can They say will more be. <laughs> Also, yeah. Now, one, th one thing to know, and we always talk about how we iterate, we go back, we change, we evolve the game system. As the uh, airships have come online, we have said, okay, how are we going to use them? <laughs> and Because a year ago, if you would be here, I'd say, no, nah, probably not. We probably wouldn't do something like that. Now, we have airships. We know the technology. We know how they're functioning, and we're going to be incorporating them into the game. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, I'm not getting waved off by the enforcer quite yet, so I think we have time for another one. I'll give a quick one. Um, so you mentioned multiple guilds. Uh, w will you have uh, alliances similar to how you had in faction so multiple guilds can like group together in one large super guild faction with one cross chat kind of thing? So we haven't uh, figured out exactly how we're going to do that but we, we definitely want um, 
guilds to be able to cooperate with each other and, and for guilds to, to be able to um, have sort of shared goals. But uh, yeah, we haven't finalized details on that. So sorry, I can't, can't quite answer that yet. All right, one more. Fantastic. Um, I actually had a question about the dying system. Um, I was wondering if you, I, I know you were excited. You, 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 see, you haven't had a certain question all day, so. Um, so what happens when you die? Okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> do we go to a magical place? No. Um, the real question Very is, is had, had you guys ever considered, uh, I, I, you mentioned that you have 400 different dyes, so you guys don't actually have a system that would be set up for uh, creating a range in terms of contrast or uh, a full color wheel. So yep. had you ever considered creating uh, a suggestion highlight that would go along with the dye. So say you had a lapel or a full coat, and you dyed the main part of it, I want to say brown, and you would highlight complementary colors for you know, highlights or accents. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know you have 400 different, I, I know you have 400 different uh, dyes individually named. Tooltips are nasty, so I, I don't know if you guys would want to actually be able to set up an algorithm for looking for something like that, though. See, uh, that would be a programming question, so I was the one that, that, that I did the dye colors. Yeah, that, so that's that's, stuff. that's just fine. I, I will just say, I, will say I, I, I stand by my I like it before, so I, I will go back and, and see if that is something feasible, but I'm not the brain behind of actually making it feasible. All right, <laughs> thank you. So I, I do like the idea that if you're going to create an abominable comet, uh, color combination, a little Asura pops up in the lower corner and says, Hi, it looks like you're about to make a fashion mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We got that for you. Go ahead. Would you like help? <laughs> How are you guys doing? Um, I was just wondering, you guys haven't talked about the mobile app for a long time, and I was just wondering if there's going to be any kind of gameplay to that that you can do outside the in-game world to contribute to maybe your profile or the game or any yeah, kind of so new features? Yeah, so the mobile app stuff is still kind of under development, so um, we'll, uh, you know, we, we still plan on having um, all the things that we, that we have talked about. Um, and we're developing additional stuff, but we're, we're basically not talking about that yet. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, is that it for us? Okay. Hey, th thank you very much for all your questions and for your attendance. Give yourself a great round of applause and for our panelists. And thank you for the orange iPhone. <laughs>